welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Walinga and I'm a professor of communication and culture at Royal Roads University. Welcome to our webinar series on sport, leadership and social change. This is episode four. We had an episode on women leadership in sport and this is part two. We had such an interest in that topic and there's so much to talk about, so much evolving in this realm that uh, I wanted to invite a few more people to speak. And today we have the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with Pam Buisa. And I am really excited, really grateful to have Pam here with us. I met her a few years ago as I worked with some of the rugby teams and, and individuals with my buddy, Kim, uh, Kirsten Barnes. And I've just been loving watching Pam evolve. Uh, I first noticed her at UVic when she was playing for the Vikes. And of course, now she's on the national team and, and hoping to play at the Olympics. Uh, we're all getting ready for the Olympics, but there's so much uncertainty. So I'm sure we'll chat about that a little bit. I always like to give a little background and of course, acknowledge the lands that we're, we're on and coming from and broadcasting from. I personally also live on the lands of the Lekwungen and Kwisatsen people, also known as Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations communities. And we always wanna thank and acknowledge these people because in our history in Canada, they've often been forgotten or marginalized. And it's so important to work toward reconciling that gap in our history and our, and our awareness and consciousness. So we wanna give thanks to the ancestors the supernatural ones, creatures, big and small, hereditary leaders and matriarchs for looking after the rich resources and cultural teachings of this beautiful land and welcoming us uh, to participate and learn and teach on these lands as well. This path is my um, home path. I, I live near Mystic Vale. And it's always ironic for me that the same path is a very similar path is one that I follow to get to my office in the morning on the campus. I haven't been there for almost well over a year now and really miss it, but I'm so thankful I have Mystic Veil to remind me of that space and that beauty and to remind us to all learn from nature constantly. This episode is part of a webinar series on sport leadership and social change. We believe at Royal Roads that uh, we take a very interdisciplinary stance in learning and teaching and a transformational social change, social purpose kind of uh, approach to learning and teaching. And of course, sports for society is one of these transdisciplinary topics that touches on all the themes that we hold very dear to our heart at Royal Roads around humanitarianism and development, diversity and inclusion, education, environment, equity and human rights, health, media, communication, and peace. And as a former uh, Olympic athlete, I think it's so important that we leverage sport, but also explore sport for what it can teach the world in these areas. We also have a partnership with Game Plan at Royal Roads, and this is someone that Pam will probably know, Andrea Burke. She was one of my advisees, but she helped me kick off this partnership because what we believe in at Royal Roads is that we acknowledge people's professional experience, not just their educational experience. And that learning happens everywhere, of course. So we give credit to people when they bring, you know, five to 10 years, 20 years of experience in different sectors, including sports. So I really enjoyed welcoming athletes onto our campus to take part in our programs in whatever capacity they're interested in. And I act as that game plan liaison for Royal Roads University. And now let's go to, uh, let's move to Pam and uh, I'll stop sharing. Welcome Pam, great to see you. Your smiling face on a Saturday morning. <laughs> really grateful. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so grateful to spend the time with you. And this is a real advantage I find when I get to actually have an interview with an individual uh, as an alternative to the panel. The panels start to get a bit crowded. So it's really great to have some time to spend with Pam here and ask her various questions, but from her specific pers perspective. So Pam, of course, uh, I would love to hear a little bit more to begin with just from about you. You're on the National Sevens Rugby team. You are looking forward to competing at the Olympics in July. Uh, you have a, a long history in sport. And I, I think I read that you started in basketball, but again, I've been following you for years and really exciting to see you also expanding your reach as a leader. 
and be, being a real social activist around issues that, that are important to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your journey, and uh, how things are going for you in this realm? Yeah, so, um, yeah, as you said, I play rugby. I've um, been on the team for about uh, five years. I'm originally from the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Territory, also known as the Ottawa Gatineau area. Um, and uh, I moved here, yeah, with the aim of focusing on the Olympics, focusing on, um, I told my parents, playing, playing going to school also, um, and studying political science, minor of social justice as well. Um, and kind of just like, also really wanted to play rugby and sport. And I think for myself, the biggest thing was when my reality was shaken in terms of uh, you know, this global pandemic and seeing how um, disproportionately different people are um, in, in having a tougher time than I, I am. And my reality was shaken when the Olympics was postponed or took, taken away from, that, from me in that moment. And kind of being exposed to different situations in different communities and seeing how some people's reality made that they may not have food tomorrow um, or that they may not um, be able to walk safely um, in what they're wearing and in who they are and how they are. So I think for myself, um, I've become very passionate about um, shedding light and insight um, from my lens, but also given the spaces that I'm in, you know, we're in high performance, we're traveling, we have a lot of exposure. Um, with that, we're also kind of in a bubble. And I think I realized that, you know, we, the term like being in your bubble was very much presented during this pandemic. But I think before that, we have always been in our bubble. We've not necessarily branched out outside of where we are. And I think, um, being on social media, having these algorithms in play that you only focus on who is in your bubble, you don't really expand beyond that. So yeah, passionate about learning more about different people, different ideas and the thoughts and experiences. Um, yeah. The key, isn't it? It's just the key to, to really uh, learning together and being a more healthy and sustainable and, and equal society. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been quite a couple of years, a few years, <laughs> really. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, almost like um, peaking with this COVID. Okay, let's start by asking a little bit more about sport for you and, and why do you believe in sport? What has sport meant for you? What role has it played in your life? A tremendous one. I think for myself, the more I am playing and evolving in the sport, it's, oh, it's always been a release for me. It's always been a form of expression a form of strength in the way that um, I was always really a part of team sports and I've always really liked team sports is the fact that I had a part to play. And, you know, whether in society beyond sport is that you may not necessarily feel like you have a part to play, but when you're on a team, you have a place, whether you're on the field, whether you're on the bench, whether you're bringing the waters, whether you're the coach, whatever it may be, you have a part to play. And I think for myself, it was that release of um, being able to showcase my strengths um, and specifically rugby, my aggression, um, my physicality and not being kind of suppressed or silent for that. And I think it was very much embraced. Um, and I think, yeah, I think sports was always a release for me to to feel, to be, and then to have my teammates and people around me supporting me in the process. That's beautiful. Thank you. That idea of, you know, really being able to be yourself out there. I've heard that theme echoed from lots of athletes and, and how beautiful is that, right? To play your part, your unique part and to be free to be you and not stigmatized in any way for being overly aggressive, right? It's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this first, um, topic that we're exploring is around gender equity, but we also have an upcoming episode on human rights in general. And, and I find the themes, of course, do broaden in our MA Intercultural International uh, program, where often I find all the research questions are the same. They all end up aligning around stigma and, and oppression and marginalization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do we change that for people based on ability, race, gender? So really interested in your perspectives on that. Why, what do you, what makes gender equity in sport in particular important to you? Why do you think it's important to, to have that as a key kind of issue that's broadcast more widely? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's so important because 
beyond just having representation and having, you know, let's say women and uh, people that identify as women in these spaces, it's about the practice and, and it being fair within all levels. I think when it's equitable, um, there's, it, it allows for, the, for, for representation to be purposeful and intentional. So it's not just there, it's because it's equitable. It, it makes sense, it's fair, it's distributed. Um, and that representation not only empowers people to wanna partake in that structure, but also makes people feel like they are worthy in being there. So within sport, I think it's important that um, gender equity is shown and, and, and demonstrated and played out because when it's not there and there's only the few, the pressure and burden goes on the few that are there. Um, and I think for things to move forward, um, for more women, more you know, gender diverse people to partake in, in sport is that you know it has to be equitable. We have to have the representation. We have to have a shift in practice so that that involves the sport in itself, that involves the fun, the play, um, that aspect of things. So I think um, within sport, it's so important because for everybody to be a part of the team, to partake in, 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 in the fun of it all, um, representation, fairness, um, and equity really has to be there. Yeah, yeah. And sport has such a platform, hey? I think it is one of the, I think it is the most mm, accessed pursuits in the world. You know, if you if you look at who is watching, even just on TV or something like that, sport is something people, all people can participate in. Even if you hate sport, you can still participate, right? <laughs> you hate it because you know it and you still yeah. have conceptualization of it. But you can be, you know, a participant in so many different ways as a spectator, as a supporter, as a official, as a player, blah, blah, blah. So it's really got reach. And I'm loving seeing people take advantage of that platform. And so, yes, what an opportunity to, to be diverse, but also then promote that concept of diversity. Mm -hmm. And what do, you, what do you see going on right now in sport? You know, in rugby, in your sport in particular, do you feel like it's equitable, gender equitable? In my sport of rugby, I think the how rugby is set up is gives the potential for it to be equitable. I think with how rugby is structured, you need size, you need strength, you need fast, you need agile. Everybody has a space to be there. So I think the function of how rugby has a lot, at least I'm obviously very biased, but I, I find that the way that it's been set up is that it promotes that equity. It promotes that, um, you know, in different spaces and what we need. We need to have different people coming from all walks of life to be showcased and broadcasted to then see that diversity expressed in other spaces as well. So I think for me, it's in its function and it's itself in rugby, I think that there's a lot of room and potential uh, for it to be there in and itself. You know, there's always room to grow, um, a lot of room to grow. Um, and I think that with us acknowledging that there's room to grow, there needs to be tangible things in play to, to invest in that because without, you know, it's great that, you know, there's the structure in play, but if no one's investing in actually having gender equity and actually having representation and actually having a change and shift in mindset, then nothing will happen and we'll be still stuck in the same things that we're seeing. We still will see a predominantly, a predominant anything in a certain space, right? So um, I, I remember hearing this quote from James Baldwin. He's like, um, I don't know how you feel, but I do know by the state of your institution, right? So if, if, if we see in the structure, in the institution, in sport, in rugby, that there is a predominant anything, that that is what is expressed. And with that, you have to take that and, and move it forward accordingly. Yeah, that's culture. So culture, we, we define it very clearly in our school as uh, values communicated. You know, it shows up in the artifacts, the institutions, the structures, the processes. So what you value, is going to be revealed <laughs> and in the sport of rugby i think i it's one i mean i think it is in many ways my favorite sport i'm a rower but but i love watching rugby for all those reasons for the excitement the aggression the intensity but also that diversity i love that as a teacher so welcoming to every shape and size of kid right anybody can come and try it out and the other thing i love about rugby that i've experienced is the culture of it the values it expresses in other ways not just by its function but the welcome, the welcoming nature of it that allows 
all people to come and be included. And the attitude on the pitch, you know, that, hey, here's a kid showing up, doesn't matter what they look like, how good they are, how much experience they are, we'll make it work, we'll teach us some stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the blending afterward of the uh, two teams, you know, the hosting of a dinner, mm -hmm. some sort of social experience, love that, it's promoting all the values of Olympics, hey? Yeah. Um, but but there's always that other issue of of society wide the gender inequity that we experience and it can bleed into sport hey where I see, I hear it a lot in different sports in particular where the girls the women and the girls aren't given the same access the same resources the same in sevens it's been great to watch because I think the sevens team your team has really demonstrated that when we invest in women and we invest in you because you're so great on the podium, devoted funding to your team, Olympic team. And uh, look what happens, right? Look at the strength of that team and the strength of those those games and how you sell out, at, you know, Langford Sevens is always mm -hmm. coming. Yeah. So this idea of chicken and egg though, you know, how did we, how did you get so good? Because the funding wasn't there at first and the accessibility wasn't there. What do you think made your team so, so strong? Because you didn't have all that support at the beginning. Um, I think right now, or just in general, there's this notion that people think that it just won't sell. People just don't invest in in women's sport. And I, I honestly don't know why, but I, I also feel like I do know why. I think... Um, I was having this conversation with a couple of other people is that I think when we talk about athleticism um, within the realm of like feminine, masculine, things like that, we kind of ascribe that to certain types of bodies. We ascribe strength, uh, agility, endurance to a certain type of body. And when you don't fit that, or if you represent a different side of that, um, and society kind of tells you that you should be feminine and that you shouldn't be like this and that you shouldn't be this way, oftentimes, you know, how society has kind of developed, we see that in itself that there's not a lot of money invested in, you know, seeing and watching that. And I think what it needs, what needs to happen is that there needs to be an investment in that. I think if we just say, I will equally uh, invest in women's sport as I will invest in men's sport, that will be a thing. I will invest in having women in positions of power uh, commentating and also do the same thing for men. I will make sure that if we see men playing sports, that we will also see women playing in sports. And I think the thing is, is that there's so much discrepancies from between the two. Um, and, and, you know, having to pay to watch versus having not to pay to watch, having to pay to play, having not to pay to play. I think it's, there's, there's so much discrepancies and even like beyond just the discrepancies in visibility, I think even in like geographically, there's a huge, difference if you live in the global south versus the global north, representation in that way. Um, things like in, in positions of power, uh, the composition of organizations and, and higher management, things like that. We see that time and time again. So am I surprised? No. Am I surprised that it's not necessarily articulated in, in many structures? No. But I do think that it's a shift and we have to recognize that, you know, as of right now, we need to redefine what we think about who can be an athlete, who is an athlete, which bodies are allowed to be an athlete. Um, and from that, that investment in sport, that investment in, in seeing representation and believing in that will happen as long as we shift our mindsets towards it. Beautifully put. And that's, that's probably the best conceptualization of the issue I've heard in a long time. This is why I love panels, discussions, you know, and breaking out of our, it is important to break out of our bubbles. Like I'm nodding and agreeing with you and we do need to heal, hear the alternative um, arguments. But I think you and I have both heard them a lot that, oh, it doesn't sell. You started with that. That's great because you're confronting the barrier, but then you go on to explain because we assume things about what we want to pay for, what a leader looks like, what an athlete looks like. It mostly has to be masculine. Well, no, let's change that mindset and be deliberate about that, investing in both. You challenge that, um, that assumption about what an athlete is. And we assume right now they're mostly male mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. as a society. And we need to break out of that. And I feel like women spend a lot of time 
women athletes trying to be uh, prove that we're strong or fast or all these things. Of course you are, right? Yeah, yeah. But the issue more is about can, helping people understand that athletes can be uh, all sorts of people. Yeah. And then the media representation, a few people like Megan Rapinoe makes a big point about this and Sue Bird as well in uh, the WNBA is the idea that if we had access, if we were more visible and you touched on that a little more, can you talk about that from your perspective as a rugby player? Um, do you think greater visibility would help shift the mindset, make people understand that, okay, or do you think it would almost make people hunker down in their biases about what an athlete can be or who it can be? I think that visibility is a step. I think that representation is a step, but it has to be a structural and fundamental shift in its structure. So what I mean by that is that just because you see someone more often, more, more frequently, doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to change the way that you see them. Now you just see them. I think that in order for things to change is that you need to structurally look at that from the ground up is beyond having you know a black person speak or uh anybody speak or whatever is how are we supporting for them to get there and not just by putting them in those places but from the ground up having them in every single space so i think i, I heard something the other day they're saying that um what breeds um proximity or love breeds proximity so when you see someone and, and and you care for them, right? You you want to, to be in their life, invest in them. And so there's that relational thing that happens there. But when there's that distance and there's no love and care, there's fear. And I think that with visibility, yes, you see them. Yes, you hear them. But do you care about what they're saying? And do you care about them being there? So I think beyond visibility, it's not not just visibility, but it's a structural shift and having them supported and invest in them throughout the whole way. Yes, beautifully put. And I and I rarely hear people kind of oppose love with fear, but I believe the same thing that without when you don't have the love, there's then the fear. Yeah, people think love and hate are the opposite, but I don't think mm. that's really it at all. Fear, beautiful. And so bringing people closer together, helping people. Um, understand that you know that people need to be loved and cared and invested in deliberately love that idea too of providing the support as we lift people into these roles and into the visibility because often otherwise it's just tokenism right you see the exactly. one board table and it's so lonely and terrifying yeah so how can sport do this how can through sport the vehicle of sport the the platform of sport, how can we better promote gender, the importance, the value, the, you know, the, the value of investing in gender equity? What do you think? How do we promote it? I think we promote it by um, being pretty much everywhere. I think oftentimes when we talk about sport, we, we limit it to TV, we talk about it in, you know, social media, I think sport, and, and that comes also with athletes, which is why I think that a lot of the onus is on athletes, is that a lot of the times, at least for myself, I found that I can really operate within the sporting realm. I didn't see myself, you know, commenting on things within social justice and things like that. But when we start to even empower the athletes to kind of continue and spread their wings into other spaces, whether it be in science or math or history or whatever it may be, other aspects of society, and you still carry that aspect of being an athlete, you see it, that's how sport seeps into other spaces. It's not just in our own spaces on TV and high performance, but it's also saying, hey, I am also an athlete, but I also believe that you matter. I also believe that you should live. I also believe, and that's how sport continues on its message is that, um, you know, we're not just an athlete. We're not just athletes, we're humans first. And when we lead with that, you know, humanity, we're able to get into different spaces so people can understand within that human to human level but then beyond that I can then see, oh, you also play the sport, which is why now that's my time, my relationship with an athlete with sport. And that's how I feel like is the direction of sport is that while you love to play your sport and, and, and have that sportsmanship and continue that, how much can we move as a society when we extend that to other spaces beyond our own? Love it. Love it. And it is on, I do believe too, it is on the athletes. And, but as you said earlier, you know, the, the supporters that, prepare and equip and and uh, enable the athletes to really extend into other spaces nicely put and there's you know the all blacks 
call, I don't even know if it's real or not, right? But that idea of the better, better people make better players, right? So mm -hmm. developing players as great people and developing that whole athlete, so crucial. I put a lot of energy into that, my life's work for sure. But I also believe better athletes make better people. Yes. You're touching on that. So what from rugby, what does rugby have to offer the world? What as, as a rugby player, you've learned things through rugby that you talked about sportsmanship, but what else? You know, there are some really beautiful principles that operate within the game. And I mean, I don't play, I get snapped in half, but I love <laughs> it for what I see out there on the pitch. Like, what are the principles rugby could teach the world? So many, at least for myself and the style of play that I that I am. Um, it's a battle. I get out there. And I see myself as like, I'm usually like, if I'm playing sevens, I'm like one of the biggest players. So I see any sort of opposition as if I will run over you, literally. Any sort of obstacle, any sort of, of thing in my way, preventing me from moving forward, I play as a forward, preventing me from moving forward uh, will need to be shifted and moved. And I think what that teaches me is that there is always going to be an obstacle. Always. It will not be easy. We may even lose the game. You know, like we may even lose the game. There has to be a winner. And through that, I learned that um, I can't be passive because my team depends on me. Society depends on me. I can't, I can't, you know, be selfish because I have my supporters. I have my family. I have my friends, you know, depending on me. Community depending on me. And so I have to play. And we all have to play, you know, we all have to be involved. And so the biggest thing I find with rugby is that everyone is needed. I need to get off the bench and know that I got that high five. Good job. I, I need to know that, you know, my coaches in place are, are cheering me on. Hey, great work. You, you, you know, you started the first five minutes, you're going to, the next person's going to come on. I need to know that, you know, if, if the ball's in the air and, and I see my opposition, I have to make sure my knee is prepared and, and I have that ball in my hands at the end of that, that, that ball. <laughs> you know? And so for me, I think with rugby, uh, a big thing that I have learned is that there will always be challenges. You may not win the game, but if you give everything you got in what you can control in the limited time you have in that game, um, then it makes it worth it because you have the people. Um, and even if you're there feeling like you're alone, you're not. Because whether it's your teammates, whether it's your coaching staff, whether it's the management, the organizations, the, the fans, or whatever it may be, you need to be, you need to play. Because it's still going to go on regardless. Love that. Love that. Keep going. What else do you love about rugby? You know, talk to me about your opponents. You've talked about obstacles, but I know you have a broader view of that too. You know, what because they're there, they're kind of there as a partner in this, in this process, yeah. right, of, of overcoming. I think, I think with the, yeah, the opposition, I think it's, they also have the same intent. So it's like, at the end of the day, we, we need each other. And I think it's, it's like, they have their own agenda, their own direction. It may be completely <laughs> against my objectives, but I need, I need them there so that I can, it, it's, it's still a game at the end of the day. I, I still, I still need I still need them to be a part of the process for me to even have that goal in the first place. Right. So even like beyond that within society and stuff like that, is that there will be people that literally disagree with everything you're saying, but I need them so that in the greater scheme of things, that there is that relationship that we can grow, that we can, that friction. And I think through that, it's like that, you know, there's like the, there's going to be a winner. There's going to be a loser. There's going to be, you know, people, you know, there's going to be a ref. And they're going to play the game and structure the game. And, you know, you did this wrong, go in the sin bin, you know, <laughs> like there's, there's all these things. So I think it's also understanding that as much as I have my goals, my ambitions, someone also has the same thing that may be completely against yours, but it's a, it's, it's a battle. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's literally a battle. So you kind of have to, it's, it's humbling in a way because it's like, well, uh, we're all in this really together because we have to, because um, then it wouldn't be a game otherwise. But at the same time, it's like, all I can do is control what I can control. Uh, I can't control uh, how I'll feel at the end of the game. You know, injuries happen, you know, um, 
things that you don't expect. There may be all of a sudden lightning happening in the middle of the game that has to stop. And then, you know, so it, you literally don't know. You can't control that. But what you can control is like, okay, in the moment right now, how do I feel? I can control how much effort I will put into everything. You know, and, and that's not on your teammates. Like if you don't put the effort in, then that's on you at the end of the day. If you don't put in the effort that you don't come prepared, even before you get into the game, you don't come prepared to show up, then what are you really doing, right? If you're, you're, you're then becoming a, a passive participant. So like what's worse is, is that you don't come prepared or you're just passively engaging with what you're doing. And that in itself is also, you know, bringing your team down. That's bringing your community down, your fans down because you're passively engaging. And really that's not engagement, that's just moving. Um, yeah. Love that non-engagement, that's just moving. That's just moving. I think that's where uh, the US is waking up and realizing it was that passivity that allowed Trump to kind of insidiously invade their politics, eh? And mm -hmm. have to all step up and participate, yep. and not be passive. Otherwise, yep. I love that. Mm -hmm. It is, it's seducing the, the intensity of our lives and we start to just think I'm too busy and I can't participate, we have to. Sport, have to. Yes. you've done such a good job, uh, Pam, of extending into other realms and you did it multiple times or as you described the principles you've learned through rugby and then you extend it to family, community, you know, it applies everywhere across the world. So it's a beautiful metaphor. Love rugby for that because I see it as really illustrating um, the battle in so many different ways. So sometimes you're interlocked in the scrum, right? You're interdependent. Mm -hmm. You need each other. Like you said, otherwise there's no game. There's no learning. There's no challenge or growth. But there's also the bam, right? Where you're mm -hmm. and taking someone right down to the ground and calling upon your strength that way. But there's also the battle in the air for the ball. And there's also the battle on the ground for the ball. Like it's all so many different ways of seeing challenge and um and and competition but it's, it's collaborative but it's also quite aggressive mm -hmm. yeah right tolerance for ambiguity um there's always another game so you might lose one but then you got another chance so you got another one love it love it right on um and i also wonder about your perspective on winning and losing how do you frame that for yourself what has sport taught you about that I think I have a very interesting relationship with failure. I think, you know, when I was like younger, definitely hated losing. Um, I you could ask my dad, <laughs> would be, we would lose and I'm mad for the rest of like two days afterwards. I just don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just like, I am so mad. <laughs> my relationship to failure was, it's just because failure seemed like, like it, it was like the worst thing ever. And my I think the, my limited understanding was that there that part of it is that there's going to be someone that's going to win there's going to be something that's someone that's going to lose so I think it's understanding that it's necessary like there's there's no way around that so I think for myself it was really understanding that within my relationship with failure with with losing is that beyond that that I, it's not losing it's an opportunity to learn and I think through that when you can have the opportunity to lose to lose something you can then appreciate it a bit more um and again that stems even beyond that is that like when you lose when you lose or you lose something you know really the gravity of what you've lost when it's gone right when you lose that game you're like oh man i should have done this i should have i should have you know, hydrated more so that my leg didn't cramp up. So then I should have did that extra physio. I should, you know, so there's that thing as well. So I think for myself, it's even that, you know, relationship with vulnerability is when you lose certain vulnerabilities are heightened and showcased is that, hey, you're not as quick. Maybe that's an opportunity for you to, to, to get better. Uh, but then when you're on the winning side, regardless of what your vulnerabilities that you did expose doesn't matter because you won so there's less of an opportunity for you to see where you went wrong and I think through you know obviously through high performance and stuff like that you know it's things become more and more at stake when you do lose and things like that and which why like the healthier relationship is to vulnerability even when you are winning you at least can still focus and showcase the different vulnerabilities you have and how that's empowered you to then showcase the winning that you that you've acquired as well yeah um 
good emphasis there on too how it reveals because we talk a lot about you know winning is an opportunity to learn and you see kids roll their eyes when you say that right but you've gone deeper which i think is a really crucial message to share with kids that yeah and it also heightens what's important and makes you commit like you will commit to that physio now or the warm-up or the you know yeah you'll, you'll really commit because now you see how important it is so that's really valuable and sometimes we skim over stuff until we we feel that the pain of that failure right of that loss mm -hmm. beautiful um and uh, and i mean we could talk about sport forever but um coming back to then the barrier that we see in terms of gender in sport uh you talked a little bit about how people see athletes um what we expect what we assume what we accept what we'll pay for what do you think are some other barriers to gender equity in sport? What's the most challenging thing for you? You wanna, can you expand a little more on that? I think it's, it just comes out to the very simple fact is that like we want to be seen, like we're here. And I think just being negated from the opportunity to be and to participate is so harmful because then we're constantly in a state of having to fight. Like I have to fight to, to be a coach. I have to fight to get, to get a team. I have to fight to, to, to play. I have to fight to, to, be. so I, I think it's, it's, it's a constant attack having to be, it's, it's draining. And through that, it, it becomes less people want to play sport. That's how we see participation rates with a lot of, you know, specifically women, people that identify as such, you know, that drops down after a certain age because, the barriers come up what happens when you know like discussions around when when an athlete wants to play sport like what happens if uh they also have to balance you know uh being a parent and all these other things that come that is our reality is a lot of people's realities in that space so it's kind of when we talk about gender equity is how are we actually ensuring that they're they're equipped to be there you know, like, okay, when we're talking about, say, you are a someone within sport that is in the managerial position, what if I also have to think about what's going to happen when I'm going on maternity leave? Will I be equipped and supported in that way? If not, then I may not necessarily be able to do that or even be there at all. At all. When I'm not seen or heard or considered at all, then policies and legislations won't be put in place so that I can stay there. And, and that's why we see that participation in uh, sport whether it be playing actively, whether it be in, in positions, administration, stuff like that, is limited because we're not equipped with the policies and the stuff in play to do that. So I think it's it's extremely frustrating and harmful because there's too much of a turnover. There's too much turnover. It's not sustainable um, when it's not there. Those barriers prevent people from wanting to even participate altogether. And it's like, it, it was part of my life, but it couldn't be a part of my entire life because I was not equipped or I couldn't be there because of X, Y, and Z. So I think through that, it, it, it becomes quite, uh, the barrier is that with you not being seen, accepted and heard, you then, you're, it's limited. And for some, and for a lot, because of the, you know, gender based, it's, it's even shorter and less and less people participate in it, less and less people feel encouraged to even consider it because instead of having to battle between education and you know pursuing something in sport, um, I'm gonna have to pick between the two when it should be able to marry it together. I should be able to play sport and go to school at the same time uh, with it having to, to have a barrier. But because I know that if I don't invest in my education uh, and I may not necessarily be able to get a job because sport may not pay, then there's that that it's, it's in that fringe that, you know, you can't participate. So I think through that, it's important to understand that if we want to have gender equity, we need to have a shift in, in the structure, in, in policies, in acceptance, and in, in actually city, seeing and, and seeing them and considering them in, holistically beyond their athletic ability. Um, but considering the other alternatives, considering the different factors that will help make sure that they can be there in a sustainable way and not just in a short time, but for the long time. Um, and I think that's the biggest barrier is that from the fundamental part of that, it, it, it just continues on to other aspects that prevent a lot of people from participating. Yeah, because marginalized human beings end up 
having to function, somehow do it, you know, play the sport or achieve the leadership role or whatever, but within a frame that's completely constraining, right? You know, yeah. considering their whole self or their reality or, you know, the fact they don't have funding or they don't have time off to be with their kids or whatever. I'm watching women try to get into those roles of leadership in sport or coaching, head coaching positions, and it's not built for them. So they're having to overcome all of these other barriers that don't consider their reality, their mm -hmm. living. Um, and it's, and then the pat answer will be, well, we didn't get that many applicants who were female. Oh, give me a break. Or yeah. did you go and seek them out? And, or did you structure your job description in a way that accommodates different accommodates. Barriers, Yeah. Right? And okay. considers the barriers they're having to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good work, Pam. Okay, got to get you into leadership roles, right? <laughs> Even that kind of frustrates me because, again, it sort of assumes that we have to participate in the hierarchy and the patriarchy. And why can't we kind of create a totally new structure? Wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. I'll work on that. So what are the most um, powerful acts or initiatives right now for achieving gender equity in sport, do you think? What are some things that are going on in sport that you think are working? You mentioned policy structures. And there are some people really like Canada, Canadian women in sport. It's been around for a long time. Uh, there are women like Sheila Robertson who are icons in media who are pushing to have, you know, the women's journal, uh, women's books about women, make sure that we're, you know, visible in media, participating in media more. What else is going on for you that you think is working well for that? I think it's um, the, along with everything that's being done, I think it's also showcasing the different types of women. I think, uh, within our understanding of like oftentimes even historically like the women that we did listen to would be predominantly white women so seeing more black women seeing more people within BIPOC spaces trans women different women uh, that we see um, also being broadcasted and showcased and I think through that I think um, has allowed also different has kind of shifted turn tables. I think people are kind of like, oh, like obviously you're a woman, but there's an intersection in that. And I think the intersections um, and showcasing that there's different depths to it um, adds also a bit of perspective. And I think I think earlier we were talking about, you know, visibility and representation and, and the impacts that has. I think that the more we broadcast at different types of women, the more we understand that not all women are the same. Uh, we understand that not all uh, of us want to have a certain outcome, but what we do want is to be seen. And I think that just comes down to the human humanity of things is that people want to be seen and heard. And I think when we are exposing the different types of women, the intersections um, that is so um, you know important to, to a lot of people um, is, to, is to show that. And I think um, whether it be books, I know that there's a lot of like fundraisers. Uh, I know there's Can Fund uh, that um, you know there's there's 150 women Can Fund that's done tremendous work. I was a recipient of it, um, and just seeing the different types of strategies to not only empower the recipients but also to to seek out donors um, within that, and just looking at the different ways that we can support one another, and that even though the structures may not be in place to um, specifically focus on women, that we are making our own space we are bulldozing whatever barriers there, there, there is. And I think that that's what is, is, is encouraging is seeing that happen. Yeah, it's great to see Lorraine Lafreniere in the uh, Coaching Association of Canada, you know, make big inroads around safe sport, which particularly affect uh, young women, I think. So she's bulldozing, right? We've got uh, Alison uh, San Margrave, she'll be on that panel as well and talking about Canadian women in sport and that, that, that body that's then promoting um, initiatives that can help women of all kinds. And I think, again, like sport is a showcase for some of these challenges and issues and how to overcome them. Women are doing great work to illustrate this concept that not all human beings are the same. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. not, yeah, love it. And um, what do you think about things like, because these are, you know, structural and around visibility, but I, I'm just curious, uh, what do you think about changing the Women's World Cup, you know, it would be like women's uh, NBA to just NBA, and there happened to be a men's and a women's, uh, the World Cup, Rugby World Cup, there have always been men's and women's, but they never called the World uh, Rugby World Cup the men's Rugby World Cup, right? They don't, yeah. but they, 
How do you feel about that sort of the nomenclature around sport? Because we had it in rowing too, where there was the eight, the eight race, which was the men, and then the women's eight. But mm -hmm. our always have this little extra caveat attached to it, right? Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I think I think it's really interesting because I think it's the caveat that emphasizes certain things. And I think that when there's less caveats, you kind of just have to focus on what the sport is. So when it's when we're talking about the women's eight versus the the the, the eight, um, the emphasis then kind of also showcases it's we're featuring the women specifically. So I think my perspective on that is that you know is kind of questioning the why. Why do we need to emphasize first my gender before my ability? If that's what we're we're measuring it on, like if it's talking about the NBA. Why do we have to focus on the fact that we're are, we have to highlight the difference before we we emphasize the similarity? And I think that's kind of the issue with most things is that oftentimes we highlight the difference, which sure there is, and the, and that's a hundred percent. But also with that difference, we get lost on how similar we actually are. Um, and I think that when there's more emphasis on the fact that um, we're playing the same sport. Like hockey is hockey, basketball is basketball, rugby is rugby. Like some people even question, like, oh, do you play the men's rugby? I'm like, I didn't know rugby was different from, you know, I, I you know, the rules are the exact same. So the emphasis shouldn't be that it's the 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 emphasis shouldn't be the difference. It should be the similarity. And I think the more oftentimes we can really realize that it's an equal playing field in the sense that we're doing the same things. And that that should be where we measure is the quality, the play, the 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 innovation within the sport. And that's when things can move forward. Because when, when we just focus on the nitty gritty, oh, like women's sports like this and men's sports is like this, then that divide gets bigger and bigger. And more investment goes to one or the other. That hierarchy becomes broadened. So I, I think through that, we need to emphasize also the similarities. And yes, there is difference. But it's also important to showcase that we are... We have a lot of similarities that we have to unpack and work through and for us to make each other better we need to invest in that similarity and that sameness so that we can get better for both sports across the board so important isn't it and uh you know in rowing it used to be that there was a difference that women only raced a thousand meters which actually doesn't make sense because you have to be more big and powerful more powerful to race a shorter distance but it was almost like we couldn't handle it same in tennis right where you see fewer sets for the women it's crazy um, I love this. And so rugby is really important as a sport too, because it has always had that, the same rules, the same game, the same everything. Um, the media can play a role, right? It's that chicken and egg. Like we start, CBC has promised that in CBC sports, they will always have equal balanced um, representation in the media for women and men's sports. Um, but really, it, it really should just be, hey, we're watching rugby. I even had to catch my husband one time. I said, I'm going to go see the rugby game. And he's like, the women's rugby? I'm like, rugby. <laughs> it's not going to be the language. It's rugby. Um, but we fall into these. So we have to almost be trained out of our biases as yeah. well. Okay. Cool. And, um, oh, and trans athletes, right? That's going to explode everything because we do have these gender lines. Like there are, we watch the women's game, they watch the men's game. And now we're having to navigate into this, the broader spectrum of gender. Hey, eh? what do you think that's going to do? Mm -hmm. I think that's going to shake everything. I think that it's going to redefine what is the foundations of these ideas. When we talk about masculinity, now what does that mean? When we talk about feminine and really what does it mean that's the question is that our it, it just questions the foundations of all these things that you know is so pervasive in society it's that we hear about you know a woman is like this a black person is like this a uh, a white person you know all these different things that we have ascribed these stereotypes and it it then forces people to then have to look individually look at the individual look at the person see how the structures are have in play obviously see how you know what does masculinity do for a certain person and, and what the impacts of that you have to look at that too but now you're going to have to be forced to look at how you know when we're talking about mental health are we specifically talking about it only in you know women and, and you know 
gender non-conforming spaces, are we also going to talk about mental health within men's sports? When we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to, it's just going to redefine how we speak and talk um, and, and ascribe and assume. I think the biggest thing is that we now cannot assume. And when you don't assume, you have to invest. And when you have to invest, you have to care. And when you care, there's opportunity to love, to grow, um, to show grace. Um, and, I, and I think through that, when, when you have that opportunity, then things will shift. Because when you start to care for someone that doesn't look like you, that doesn't act like you, now you have to invest in their development. And when you invest in their development, things can move forward as a society, as a collective, we can move forward, sport can move forward. So I, I think the more we showcase that these foundations of what we have created, that we have put into our society and said, this is truth, shakes what we've defined as truth. It shakes what we've, you know, just blindly followed, which I think is necessary. Love that. You know, and I think it's crucial too. We have to shake the foundation again. And cultural theory assumptions are at the bottom, but they're very invisible. And we see it show up in artifacts and values, and then it sort of blurs like an iceberg, right? It's hidden. Mm -hmm. Like you have to dig down into that and question those assumptions. And so these these artifacts, which is you know shifts in gender in sport in the world, are forcing us to dig down and question, like you're saying, right? Why do we have these divisions? What does it mean to be masculine? Is anybody masculine anymore? <laughs> you know, and yeah, it's like, yeah. really good for us. Tell me more about the bridge, because I'm very interested in, you said, when we question assumptions, we have to invest. When we don't assume, we have to invest. Why? How does that work? So when when you don't assume, so if, if I think it's like the the idea of being, of being neutral. Um, I think when we think that we're coming from an unbiased perspective, we're kind of denying where we actually are. We're, we're denying that I don't have an opinion on this. Everybody has an opinion on something. And it, it's, you'd be lying to yourself to say that you're not a political or spiritual being. We, are, we all have our own, we come from a different place. We all have different experiences, even within your own family. Like you have your own perspective on things. So when you acknowledge that you come from somewhere and that you have a certain position on something and you meet someone that is different from you and that you don't know anything about. There's that fear, there's that distance, there's no proximity, right? Now I have to know, how can I bridge that gap as we're using in COVID terms? Like how do we bridge that gap to, to go from fear to love? I have to now know your name. I have to recognize you. I have to ask you how your day is. I have to observe you. How do you move? How do you move in society? How do you how do you navigate the world? And through that, you're also learning from me. And and in that, you know, not assumption, not assuming, I'm giving you the opportunity to be. And the more opportunities we have to to be, the more that I can invest in your development. When I care about you, I now want to like, I care if you have a good day. When I ask you, I'm not asking you aimlessly. I'm asking you like, oh, how's it going? Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I ask, how are you? <laughs> you know, like, and, and through that, that's when the actual developments and, and change actually happens is that if I care about something enough, I will go the extra mile to make sure that they're okay. Right. If I care about sport enough, I'll make sure that, you know, having a person of color or a woman in that space is, is there, not because it's, it's supposed to be there, but because I want it to be there. And when we move between that assumption to, to love, to grace, and then understand that, you know, people just want to be seen, right? That we want to be heard. And I have to care about you, right? And, and that's what it is, is that if you don't care, it won't happen. That's the reality. So, yeah. It's really, it's indigenous teachings, isn't it? That idea of stance. And it's funny how as you, as we learn and explore and understand better, I start to see, well, yeah, that's the basis of so much, you know, that where, where do I come from? Mm -hmm. And then trying to bridge the gap. We use a bridge in our school of communication and culture. And we always say it starts with minding the gap, which makes me really feel aligned with what you were saying, where I have to, I have to know about you first before I can extend a hand or a hug or build some kind of, you know, structural bridge between nations or groups or communities. 
it starts with minding the differences and understanding mm -hmm. how we're different, beautiful. So this is leading really nicely into this idea of human rights more generally, right? And we're starting to go there, which I, I think there are so many connections in that the, the gender discussion has helped us forge into this other broader discussion of rights in general. And that, um, and women are so brave. I really do, I love that, that um, description of that image of bulldozing, like we're building our own structures, building um, out of care and love and an understanding that we all need to be in this together. So tell us a little more about your involvement in fighting for human rights more broadly. Um, you were involved in leading rallies when Black Lives Matter was was um, emerging again, you know, again and again. And what's it going to take? You know, what are your thoughts on this? What's happened in the past few years? The role sport is increasingly playing. Go for it. Tell me your reflection. Yeah. So um, what's wild about all of it is that it, it was all within kind of looking introspectively as to where I am. So kind of like situating myself. I found when my reality was shaken in terms of rugby, I had to now question who am I without rugby? You know, I strongly identify as like, I am this rugby player. My worth is wrapped up. And if I'm able to offend you and, you know, run over you and step you and run past you, but beyond that, who am I? So I think the biggest step was realizing, okay, uh, what am I good at? Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> what can I do beyond this? And, and so with my involvement with a lot of um, the different movements has been um, a lot of self-discovery. I think my, my first involvement was, uh, I, I was when, you know, the murder of George Floyd was, you know, quite, it was super public. I, I didn't know what to do, but just go on my phone and just stay informed. And then I got a notification from a friend, Vanessa Simone, that's like, hey, I'm having a rally. Um, you wanna come out? I've never attended a rally. It's like, okay, I'll show up. I got there and I brought water bottles and I just saw her running around and I was like, okay, what am I good at? I got my phone. I pulled out my phone. I was like, hey, I went on social media. Uh, I'll be here at five o'clock. I'm inviting I invite all your friends to come out. Close to over a thousand people showed up that day. And I was like, okay, I could connect. Okay, I'm learning at that. Continue that, reached out to another friend, Asiya Robinson. She reached out to other friends as well. Okay, how do we connect? We're good at connecting. How do, how do we continue that? As I'm learning about myself, I'm learning about my, my who I am really. So uh, we went the day before the rally. It was important for me to connect with the people in which lived there. There was a, a tremendous in-house community. So I made sure that I talked to every single person that lived there, asking them if it was okay. In my understanding of, of being decolonial in my efforts is being relational. I need to know if it's okay to do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. For you to be a part of it, I need to not just assume that it's okay. I need to ask. Consent, consent culture and things like that. So I'm gonna ask you, is it okay? And then as well, I, I, we went and talked to the indigenous, uh, the stewards of the land, the Lekwungen speaking people's territories and said, hey, is this okay? They said, yes, okay. We're connecting, we're building, we're investing in each other. And through that, we're like, how do we talk about police brutality? How do we talk about discrimination? How do we talk about injustice if we only have certain bodies there? We need everybody. You know, whether you're white, black, whatever, everybody is, you know, a, a victim in the sense that there's a perpetrator that is continue to cause harm and may not even know that they're causing harm. They're benefiting from the privilege that was before them, before their time and continuing that. There's people that are recipients of that and having that intergeneral trauma that's continuing that. So I think it's important that everybody is a part of the conversation, included in the conversation, also understand where they fit and, and, and their role with, within that whole, within the issue um, and the different issues within that. So. Uh, in the second rally we had, different medias are coming, like, what are your thoughts on this? And I'm like, listen, the community will talk. And so the biggest thing, when we got on the stage, people were like, oh, the speakers you had, I'm like, I literally had a mic. And I'm like, I'm not gonna introduce you. You take the mic, you show the world who you wanna be introduced as. Someone took the, and that's all it was. I took the mic, I'm like, hey, you take the mic. Someone's like, I got something to say, you take the mic, you take the mic. And that's all it was, is that we need to come to a place where if we're talking about community, that we keep us safe, we need to make sure that we understand um, 
that the power is in us, that we can do something. If we all partake in, partake in this, that those that whose voices have been silenced, have been suppressed, that they need to come to the front. And we need to make sure that they're, like when we're talking about policy, that they, there's structures to empower them to be there and feel like that they're welcome in those spaces. And so, um, yeah, my involvement with a lot of that has been reaching out to different disenfranchised communities, whether it be um, people that use substances and learning more, especially playing sports, you know, like that's not a part of it, you know, like, you, you know, we get drug tested all the time. We're not exposed to that. And then working at a hotel where a lot of people who do use substances and people who do deal with mental health, people that have different visible and invisible disabilities and realizing that I have never been exposed to that. I've never been exposed to the opioid crisis and all the different crises that are happening that was not in my bubble. And branching that and, and being relational and understanding how did you get from point A to point B has been a journey and, and learning more and from people that have been in the field for a long time and my commitment to want to learn has been you know, very helpful. So I think, yeah, a lot of my involvement with human rights has been connecting with different humans. <laughs> Beautiful, right on. Love that, the self-discovery, connection, learning what you're good at, then figuring out how to connect better, the, uh, you know, the relationality of it and the asking. These are really great uh, tools and reminders for people that, you know, we can extend to everybody, right? Uh, the key to breaking down these kind of barriers and walls and, and re and sort of shifting our mindsets right around how we participate in the world. It's going to be better for everyone. I love what you said too about everyone's a victim of this stuff. I think we only think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the concrete victim that's on the ground or the one that's been marginalized that they're the victim somehow, but everybody is. We're all behaving badly <laughs> when this <laughs> is your way. Yeah. I want to finish off with a, a big question, but just hear as much as you want to share here, this idea of, um, in, you know, sport organizations, I'm watching growing, national sport organization of rowing in Canada, really want to do better. And it's one of the most exclusive, you know, very white privilege kind of sport you can imagine, uh, very colonial in its roots. And so it's got a long way to go. And what do we say to these sport leaders in the sports that are, that are reaching out, wanting to change? Where do they start? You know, what's it going to really take? for sport to do a better job of being more inclusive? I think it goes down to, why are you there? <laughs> Who are you servicing? For what function? And uh, why do you need to be there? And I think when you understand who you're servicing, then you realize um, I need to talk to X, Y, you know, when they're doing in business, it's like, who is, who is the audience? Who, who are we doing this for? Right. When you actually know who you're doing this for, you know, who you're actually not doing it for. And I think that's where the biggest critique is, is that when we look at sports that are, you know, predominantly white and um, exclusionary in its, in its practice, they know who they're doing it for. They also should focus on who they're not doing it for and then unpack that. Why? Why should these people not be a part of your sporting career? Why should not they be a part of your history? Why should they not be a part of your organization? Why can't they play, <laughs> right? And I think when we unpack our why, when we unpack the foundation and root of, of the issue, um, you're able to then get out of that state of denial. No, 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 we're, we're doing a good job. Like I, I heard, I was listening to a uh, name, guy named Brian Willis. He uses this really cool. I've been using it everywhere. Is the, the impact of isms. He used the parallel of alcoholism and racism, right? The first step is addressing you have an issue. Um, and that's with everything. When you address that I have been causing harm, I have been actively excluding by only focusing on who's included, then I am, this is the issue that I um, have been you know, only not diversifying my space. I have not been challenging my own ideas. I've not engaged in unpacking my own ideas that I haven't addressed what the issue is. So that's the first step. 
so that you can get out of that denial. Because when you're in denial, you're just you're just being complicit. You're just actively engaging and being passive and not doing anything. And then when he was saying about the isms was about, you know, the the idea of of when people say you're sober, that's that doesn't make sense. You're constantly in recovery. You're constantly working to to move in with your relationship with whether it be alcohol, whether it be with people of color, you're constantly evolving. It's not always gonna be the same. You're not gonna just be presented with a drink and be like, oh no, it's gonna be easy and you walk away. You're gonna have to think, what am I gonna do in this situation? If you're at the club, what are you gonna do at the situation? If you're having drinks with a boss, what are you gonna do in that situation? Every situation is different. Now with me knowing that I have an issue, me understanding that this is gonna be a constant path, that this is a, a, a long journey. I need to understand that not by me, you know, looking and reading a book, it's, it's gonna have all the answers. I need to understand that every situation will be different. I'll also be received very differently every single time. And I need to be okay with that. But also, what am I doing to make sure that I'm learning every single time there's a different opportunity coming about? So to kind of bring it to, you know, the heads of organizations and things like, who are you servicing? Do you recognize that there's an issue? And with that, when you recognize there's an issue, what are you doing to change that issue? And, and in even the process of understanding what the issue is, who's helping you understand that? Are you still empowered by those that have the same line of thinking as you? Or do you have people that don't agree with you, that disagree with you, that's gonna challenge your thinking? So then when you challenge your thinking, you can unpack your thoughts. You can engage in that recovery, engage in that process. And then when you have different relationships, you now know, maybe don't do this. Maybe shift my, my thinking. Maybe I shouldn't even speak on it. Maybe I'll just have someone who does know better speak on that. And there's that humility. That maybe I shouldn't even be in this situation because it's not, I, I don't know. And it's okay that I don't know because there's someone that does. And I may not be the expert on, on this, but someone that is should be there and I can learn from that. So the more we engage in that recovery in that relationship in being actively anti-racist and that's a journey. It's not gonna be, I read a book, I'm, I got it, I'm saved. No, you have to commit, you have to continue in that because it's, it's, it's a long, it's just for the long haul. Love it. I think I mentioned, you know, this program we have, uh, I find all the students in the MA Intercultural and International Communication Program are, are sent honing in on kind of the same research question, you know, student after student always has to do with an ism. So whether it's ability or alcoholism or, you know, some kind of um, stigmatization of someone, right? And they're all trying to solve that problem. So I'll definitely add the link of Brian Willis as well. Love that uh, resource. And the purpose-centered, when we're purpose-centered, of course, we'll be more humble, won't, won't we? If we're actually serving the why of our sport, of sport in general, of course, we'll be trying to serve everybody, right? Because that's the whole point of it, yeah. And then we will reach out and we will be more humble to bring in the people that need to be there and not expect us to have all the answers. Really nicely put. Um, Thank you so much, Pam. This has been really deep and powerful and you've given so much, I think, so much insight and guidance and language that we can use as we try to keep battling. Love that reference to the constant evolution too, because bias is deep and it's safe as well, right? People mm -hmm. are coming from places of privilege where it's comfortable and, and maybe we're afraid to let go of it. But you also share for us um, a new world, right? A view of a new world and how it can be, where we are in a constant state of learning and relation. Beautiful, thank you. I hope to connect with you again, And but thank you so much for devoting this time. We've had um, 75 minutes of your time, <laughs> really appreciate it. And we will be you know, sharing this more broadly on through our website and our channels and, and uh, keep up the good work. You're just doing such fantastic work, having an impact and and being so purposeful in your, I want to finish with one last question, actually. What yep. is sport for? Why sport? Sorry, I missed that first part. What is sport for? Why sport? Why do we need it? Because, at least for myself, you need that release. You need, it, it just, it just is such a good holistic representation of how life can be. It's a game. It's it's. We have a role. 
we we need to just play because we never know what other factors will partake in it. But sport is just so powerful in the sense that it has the capacity and the ability to, to be literally everywhere. Um, and I think that the more we, we bring it with us, that we, we use it as a tool to, to include, to, to shake different systems and structures, to shape minds and mindsets. I think that that's where um, that release, um, opportunity for vulnerability, opportunity for confidence and strength can happen. And I think that's why sport is so important because it, it, it changes lives really. Beautiful, thank you. Have a great day. You too.